Coming up now, we're going to hear from two recognized individuals, not only military, but in the intelligence world, who are going to talk to us about what the facts are as it, as it concerns the real status of the MEK as a potential threat. These individuals were in charge of determining whether they were a threat or not. And it's my honor to introduce a General Deptula, who was in charge as Deputy a director for the U.S. Air Force Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance. If anybody ought to know, it's the fellow that was in charge of that as to whether um, Cap Ashraf and the people who reside there are a threat. So let's hear it for General Datula. Well, thanks very much for the uh, kind uh, introduction, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It really is a, uh, an honor, a privilege, and a pleasure to be here today uh, and join with the members of this uh, very distinguished panel uh, to advocate for the free Iranian uh, community. And uh, Patrick, let me add my thanks, too, for your passion and uh, eloquence in articulating and summarizing what we all are here to attempt to accomplish. Now, there's a best-selling book out there about leadership and inspiring people to take action. And the name of that book is Start With Why. So let me start today by following that advice. Why support the free Iranian cause? Well, it really boils down to two principal reasons. The first, um, as you heard so eloquently from Secretary Chavez, is that it's the right thing to do from a human rights perspective. The second is that it's the right thing to do from a U.S. national security perspective. Following the liberation of Iraq, several U.S. government agencies conducted a thorough investigation of residents of Ashraf and then recognized them as protected persons under the Fourth Geneva Convention. We heard that firsthand this morning from General Phillips. There is no better testimony or source of the facts. From 2003 to early 2009, U.S. forces protected Camp Ashraf from attacks by the Iranian regime. After that, however, Iraqi forces have launched attacks several times on the camp's defenseless residents, killing nearly 50 and injuring over 800. What's Tehran's, re uh, Tehran's uh, reaction to these attacks been? Well, it's to praise the Iraqi army for those attacks, and they've asked Baghdad to continue attacking the MEK until their destruction. Now, since these attacks, the situation has become more complicated. You know about last December's uh, UN Memorandum of Understanding, uh, drafted to relocate the residents of uh, Ashraf to Camp Liberty. Since that time, nearly 2,000 residents of Ashraf have moved to Liberty. The Memorandum of Understanding signed by the UN and the government of Iraq explicitly says that Iraq will ensure, quote, the transit locations meet humanitarian and human rights standards. Let's do a brief review of how support of these standards in regard to Camp Liberty are not being followed. The fifth movement of residents from Ashraf to Liberty occurred earlier this month. This was the worst movement in terms of limitations imposed on them by the Iraqi government. Iraq imposed new restrictions preventing the residents to take properties that had already been agreed to. The inspection before they departed lasted more than a week while residents were constantly being harassed by the Iraqi forces. And as a convoy left Ashraf, after an hour, the Iraqis in yet another violation of their commitment stopped six utility vehicles and returned them back to Ashraf. Then the Iraqis did not allow the residents to transfer special trailers or cars for the disabled, so those individuals were not able to go to Camp Liberty. As we've heard today, Iraqi police are stationed inside the camp equipped with 11 armored personnel carriers and dozens of armed police patrol Camp Liberty. And one of the Iraqis instrumental in previous attacks on Ashraf was appointed as the person in charge of Camp Liberty. The UN in repeated statements has emphasized the need for freedom of movement for the residents of liberty, yet no freedom exists. 
The legal counsel for Liberty residents is barred from visiting. Water supply continues to be a major concern, and there's a shortage in the camp. Electricity is another significant problem. It's not connected to the national grid, and the residents rely on small generators that are going to be insufficient for the upcoming hot weather. Camp Liberty is really, as you've heard people allude to and state, it's not an appropriate name for what's going on there. Camp suppression is more like it. Reaction from the United States in this entire chain of events was to condemn the attacks against Camp Ashraf and support the UN in its efforts to relocate the inhabitants to camp suppression. But more can and must be accomplished if the United States is to live up to our principles of vigorously supporting human rights. Now, given that US forces are no longer in Iraq, the most effective tool we have in protecting the people of Ashraf, protection that we assured those people in 2004, is to remove the MEK from the list of foreign terrorist organizations. You all know that the United Kingdom and the EU have removed the MEK from their terrorist list, and we need to do the same. Meanwhile, the Iranian regime is continuing to create propaganda that attempts to demonize the MEK, as we saw just a couple of months ago, when an Iranian spokesman told NBC the Mossad had been flying MEK members to Israel for training and send them to Iran, and to sending them to Iran to carry out assassinations. This set of untruths was no accident. Just as the support is growing to remove the MEK from the list of foreign terrorist organizations, this fabrication was injected into the media in an attempt to prevent delisting. The Iranian opposition has survived a level of repression that's unparalleled in modern times. From a human rights perspective, it's long overdue to reverse that oppression. Furthermore, the removal of the MEK from the foreign terrorist organizations list would send a signal to the people of Iran that the United States is standing with them rather than with their oppressors. Okay, let's take a look at this issue now from a U.S. national security perspective. The current Iranian regime is a brutal theocracy where the description of their government as a collection of zealots is not an exaggeration, it's a fact. Iran today is a center of international terrorism, and much of it is aimed at the United States. The Iranian regime uses terror as an instrument of policy both internally and externally. This is why an Iranian nuclear weapons capability would pose a monumental security risk not only to countries in the Middle East and in Europe, but would threaten the stability and security of the entire world. Now, summarizing the analysis of the impact of a nuclear-armed Iran are six major concerns that the U.S. originally laid out by Ambassador Robert Joseph, the former Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. First, an Iran with nuclear weapons would embolden the regime to carry out its aggressive ambitions in the Middle East and beyond. Second, a nuclear capability in Iran would pose a direct threat to U.S. forces in the region to European allies and possibly the continental United States. And I would add that just recently, the Iranian government, current regime, announced that it intended to launch a satellite into orbit uh, as early as next week. And if you put one and two together, if you can launch a satellite into orbit, you can launch an intercontinental mi missile that may not threaten possibly threaten the continental United States, but certainly will threaten the continental United States. Third, proliferation of nuclear weapons would ensue by nations in the region that would feel compelled to attain their own nuclear capability to counter around. Recently, the London Times reported that Saudi Arabia could acquire nuclear warheads within weeks of Iran developing atomic weapons as a threat from Tehran triggers an arms race across the Middle East. Fourth, Nuclear weapons would consolidate the Iranian mullah's power and guarantee their survival, thus severely degrading the prospect of democracy in Iran. Fifth, the bomb would become an existential threat to Israel, given Iran's stated objective of wiping Israel off the map. And sixth, Iran's role at the nexus of weapons of mass destruction and terrorism would make it likely that the regime would sell nuclear weapons to other countries or terrorist groups. For decades, the regime has made punishment of the Iranian opposition its prime negotiating point, 
compelling Western nations to restrict the organization's activities while trying to eliminate. In that Wall Street Journal report today, you may have noticed a quotation by some nameless diplomats that are concerned that the action to delist may upset the current Iranian regime. That's all the more reason to delist now. Unfortunately, their tactics have been too successful. The most significant result being the 97 designation by the, of the MEK by the U.S. State Department as a foreign terrorist organization. However, in reality, the Iranian regime's survival depends on how much it can suppress an increasingly uneasy and critical internal population. The resistance inside Iran is coming to, committed to undermining these repressive policies, but a nuclear arsenal would create a more powerful and resilient repressive regime and eliminate any hope for democratic change. This is why the Iranian people, even more than the rest of the world, cannot afford a nuclear-armed Iran. Iran has never been more vulnerable than it is today. Their leaders' fear is that the organized opposition will continue to gain more visibility and international support. Keeping the MEK on the list of foreign terrorist organizations is limiting U.S. national security options unnecessarily while the Ayatollahs are threatening us and the rest of the world with their nuclear bomb making. Removal of the MEK from the list is in the United States' best interest from a national security perspective. Removal would also send a strong message to the Iranians that their efforts to unseat the radical fundamentalist leaders would no longer be viewed by the United States as terrorism, but rather as an exercise of their legitimate right to change the future. So President Obama, Secretary Clinton, it's time to make this important contribution to the security of the United States and to the world, as well as reiterating your commitment to defend human rights. Remove the MEK from the list of foreign terrorist organizations, and as has been said before, not in 60 days after the last people moved from Ashraf to Camp Suppression, but now. Thank you very much. <laughs>